The Great Famine, otherwise known as the Irish Potato Famine or the Great Hunger, decimated the population of Ireland between 1845 and 1852, with millions dying of starvation or leaving Ireland for hopes of a better life. It is estimated that over 1 million people perished of starvation and 2 million more leaving mainly to North America. Just how could this happen in the United Kingdom at a time when it was one of the most wealthiest countries in the world? Well, that is exactly what we will be looking at today. In order to understand the effects of the famine, we must first understand life for the average Irish farmer. The 1841 census revealed that of the 8 million people living in Ireland, more than half relied upon working the land instead of working for a regular wage. Most farmers did not own the land on which they worked, instead working as tenant farmers. This meant that farmers would have to pay rent for the land and attempt to make money from what they could grow. These farmers worked on land owned by rich Protestant Englishmen who often lived in Britain or owned by Anglo-Irish families. These families were descendants of English settlers who were given land in the 17th century and how they acquired this land is a tale for another day. Combined, these classes of landowners held 80% of the land in Ireland, which represented the best agricultural land. The leases for these lands were administered by a cadre of middlemen. These middlemen were employed by the absent landlords, and they would extract as much profit as possible. They ruled over the tenant farmers with an ever-looming threat of eviction, or they would only give them one-year leases, keeping the population in a state of instability and fear. The land would be divided up to be often only an acre or two per tenant farmer in a web of leases and subleases. One in four tenant farmers leased only an acre or so, and one in three of these farms were not able to support those who worked upon them. Farmers would struggle to grow crops enough to cover the rent and feed themselves and their families. As a result, many would take seasonal labour roles to supplement their income, but very often these small farms ran at a loss, often in arrears of the rent. Profits made from the land were very often sent out of Ireland and very rarely invested back into the country. The result of these measures created a class of people who merely subsisted living in abject poverty. If it were not for one particular crop, life for these farmers would have been impossible, a crop that was both easy to grow and nutritious, the potato. To be specific, the Irish lumper was the potato variety relied upon by the Irish. An acre of land could grow enough potatoes for a large family to live through the year. The Irish lumper not only allowed families to survive, but allowed them to grow. Since the potatoes induction into Ireland, the population had dramatically increased, doubling over 100 years. Potatoes could grow in pretty much anywhere in Ireland and in small plots of land. As a result, one third of the arable land was used to grow potatoes. It was estimated that the average Irishman would eat as much as 14 pounds of potato a day. The reliance on potatoes, and in particular one variety, would be one of the reasons for such a devastating famine. A nasty strain of Pythoptera infestants that originated in Mexico made its way to North America and then found its way to Europe with disastrous consequences. The blight would render the whole crop as nothing more than a putrid sludge, a rotting horrid smell leaving the potato completely inedible. Worse still, it spread easily amongst the uniform crops of Irish lumpers. In November of 1843, it was clear that the potato crops were failing. In response, Robert Peel, the then Prime Minister of Britain, purchased a large quantity of corn and set up various food stores around Ireland. A scientific commission was established to find the cause of the blight 
and whether there was a remedy. In addition, he repealed the corn laws in a bid to encourage the crops that were exported to Britain to remain in Ireland. Now this was largely unpopular with the landowners who benefited from these protectionist policies and high prices for their crops. But due to those in need unable to afford the produce available and the corn from Britain taking longer to arrive, the famine grew gradually worse. This was compounded by the defeat of Peel's government in 1846. Peel at least somewhat understood the needs of the Irish and attempted to resolve the famine shortly after it started. He was prepared to offer governmental assistance, despite the fact it would have an effect on the profits of the landowners. His successor John Russell had the complete opposite approach. The subsequent government was greatly influenced by the economic system, laissez-faire. To briefly describe this philosophy, it is that the free market without government interference will resolve any issue. By 1847, the civil servant in charge of the relief effort in Ireland, Charles Trevelyan, replaced the food programs with policies more in keeping with laissez-faire ideals. Workhouses and soup kitchens were established, funded by the Irish farmers through taxation, but these were of such poor standard in order to discourage their use. Furthermore, Trevelyan was of the opinion and was by no means alone in his thinking that the blight was the divine intervention to deal with the Irish way of life. Many in Britain viewed the Irish as dependent on the potato, as having families that were too large, and as the wrong kind of Christians as they were predominantly Catholic. Trevelyan sent a letter to a colleague regarding the potato blight. He said, the judgment of God sent the calamity to teach the Irish a lesson. Whilst the poor in Ireland were starving, the produce exports to Britain did not stop. The middlemen arranged for tons of grain and cattle to be sold overseas. The allure of profit and the free market made anywhere but Ireland the place to sell such crops. The Irish poor could not afford the food and the government was not prepared to pay the bill. What the British government did arrange was a series of public works where the starving could work to earn money. Roads would be built, often not leading anywhere, where groups of the hungry would work for eight pence a day. This could purchase two and a half pounds of maize. Not much else was affordable. As time went on, even women and children would partake in these works in a bid to earn enough just to survive. This was hard, back-breaking work, made even harder due to the workers' empty stomachs. A condition of the aid from the British government was that those seeking help did not own or lease any farmland. Farmers would give up their homes for a shot at joining the overcrowded workhouses or a spot in the lines to the soup kitchens, huddled together in the freezing cold. In addition, the British government passed a law resulting in the landlords being liable for the arrears of all tenants flowing from the freehold. As many of the small farms ran in arrears of their rent, several of the landlords evicted the tenant farmers, and because the law prohibited the former tenants even remaining on the land, the landowners set about destroying homes and forcibly removing the evicted off the land. These conditions of the hungry and homeless were a perfect breeding ground for illness such as typhus and dysentery. Combined with the consequences of a poor diet such as anemia, many thousands died from the complications due to the blight. As crop after crop failed, the more the world looked to Ireland to understand what was happening. One such eyewitness on the effects of the famine was James Mahoney an artist commissioned by the Illustrated London News, and he was sent to Ireland and reported on what he saw. He recalls stopping in a town, coming face to face with the reality of the famine and a crowd of people eager for aid. He wrote, Amongst them was a woman carrying in her arms the corpse of a child and making the most distressing appeal to the passengers for aid to enable her the purchase of a coffin and bury her dear little baby. 
This horrible spectacle induced me to make some inquiry about her. When I learned from the people of the hotel that each day brings dozens of such applicants into the town. Famine breeds a desperation unlike any other, as witnessed by Father Peter Ward, parish priest of the Pantry and County Mayo. He wrote to his archbishop describing two instances he had witnessed. He had observed a multiple occasion where families were found dead in their homes, but disturbingly, there was evidence of cannibalism. To quote the letter he sent, the flesh was pulled from the daughter's arm and mangled in the mouth of her poor dead mother. But what is perhaps not widely understood is that the potato blight affected all of Europe, not just Ireland. Belgium was a country like Ireland that also grew a large amount of potatoes. During the 1940s, around 15% of arable land in Belgium was used to grow potatoes, which whilst not the same proportion as Ireland, is still a significant amount. When the potato crops failed, the Belgian government stopped exports of food and diverted help to those in need. Whilst the blight resulted in the death of 40,000 people, this was far less than those who died in Ireland. It is no surprise that as a result of the desperate situation that people left Ireland with a view to start again in another country. Between 1845 and 1855, an estimated 2.1 million people left Ireland, often on what were called coffin ships. Many of the landowners would opt to pay for their tenants' passage as it was cheaper than dealing with them. One witness to the conditions of these ships was Stephen de Vere, an Anglo-Irish landowner who would accompany his former tenants to Canada with the view to help them resettle. He recorded in his diary the following account of the conditions of these coffin ships. Huddled together without light, without air, wallowing in filth and breathing a fetid atmosphere, sick in body, dispirited in heart, the fevered patients lying between the sound in sleeping places so narrow as almost to deny them the power of indulging by a change of position, the natural restlessness of the disease. Those who died on board the coffin ships were dumped into the ocean without the opportunity to be given last rites. Due to the poor conditions and health of those on board, the mortality rates were often as high as 30%. Those who arrived in America, Canada and Australia often faced racism and prejudice, but they had the opportunity to start free from the blight. The Great Hunger drastically reshaped Ireland and the world. The vast movement of people leaving Ireland created Irish populations around the world, and the effects are still seen to this day. In Scotland, Irish immigrants established the Glasgow Celtic football team, a very successful team. Large populations of Irish immigrants established themselves in North America, in Boston and New York, and in Ontario and Canada. Despite the initial prejudice, these populations massively contributed to their new homes. Those who were unfortunate enough to have perished are widely remembered all over the world. Those who left Ireland bringing with them the tales of suffering endured throughout the years. It is important to note, despite some of the attitudes of those in power in Britain, there were many whose charitable efforts saved lives. The Quakers ran soup kitchens and attempted to feed as many as they could. Money was raised all over the British Empire, from as far afield as Calcutta, where the Indian sepoys and the large portion of Irish soldiers stationed there all dug deep. Queen Victoria was chastised for allegedly donating only five pounds, but in reality, she was the largest individual donor, giving 2,000 pounds. Her decision to give money was not well received by the British public. Many British people felt that sending money to Ireland was the same as dumping it into a bog. But it was the money raised by the Choctaw Native American communities that still means most to the Irish to this day. The Choctaw Nation had only a decade earlier been forced on the infamous Trail of Tears, and yet they still donated $174 to the cause. 
This has never been forgotten, and in 2020, during the recent event, the Choctaw Nation had a particularly high mortality rate, so the Irish government responded with large donations, paying forward the initial kindness. It was not until 1997 that Tony Blair acknowledged the role of the British government in failing the Irish people, and apologised for its role. Whilst famine in the Western world has become a thing of the past, there are still countries in the world where the spectre of famine casts a dark shadow. We can look to the Irish famine and the wider potato blights in Europe and decide on how we should deal with such tragedies when they strike. The plight of the Irish was made worse by the desire for profits and by the application of a political idealism, resulting in the death of one million people, exacerbated by the British ruling class, believing that the Irish were an inferior race of people.